Okay, let's talk about Senator John F. Kennedy. You made an interesting comment in the book. Your first impressions were how tall he was and the fact that his hair wasn't as bushy as it appeared on television. Yeah. All right, now other than that, how, how was he from an intellectual standpoint, from, um, you know, a one-on-one? -on -one? How did you find him early on as you were getting to know him? Well, first of all, let me tell you that I got to know him when I went to work for Bobby because he was one of the eight senators on the Senate Labor Rackets Committee. Okay. So I got uh, uh, a good contact with him right at the beginning. And then, of course, it was September of 1959 right. uh, that he decided to hire me to run the media campaign for his presidential campaign in 1960. Okay. I was, uh, let me tell you that going back to 1956 when I covered the Democratic Convention and I saw uh, JFK uh, not getting the vice presidential nomination, what really struck me was afterwards he gave a speech to the convention which I had never heard a politician speak as well my entire life. And from that moment, I was a total supporter of John F. Kennedy and wanted him to become President of the United States because I thought he would do a hell of a job for our country. So uh, that's why when uh, JFK decided to hire me, we never talked about money, we didn't talk about anything. He just said, uh, I'm going to have a campaign in 1960, I want you to work for me. That was it. Uh, we, because I was all in favor of trying to do anything I could to get him elected President. During his whole career, uh, and this is something that I like to say to the public, you know, there's a word that's come out called Camelot. And uh, in fact, uh, in the recent auction uh, of Jackie in New York, it was called the Camelot Auction. Yes, it was. But Camelot was not a word that ever came out during the Kennedy administration. This is something that Jackie said in an interview about six days after he was assassinated. And I think that you have to look at presidents in an honest way. I mean, look at the, at the very important things that they did uh, well, and also look at the things that they didn't do well. And that's always been my view on Kennedy, and uh, I think that uh, if you look at his whole career, the only real thing that he did badly was the Bay of Pigs. Yes. Now, the Bay of Pigs, as you know, was something he inherited from the Eisenhower administration, and if he had been intelligent enough to have said when he became president, well, I'm not going to go forward with that covert operation. Uh, he wouldn't have gotten into that terrible trouble. But uh, he did get into that terrible trouble, and uh, it really was uh, handled badly. Now, one of the reasons it was handled badly was that he was dealing with people that he never met before in his life who were advising him, and uh, he came out of that with a terrible feeling that anything that was a crisis, he had to have the people that he knew well as his advisors, as he did in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yes. Well, one of the things that Kennedy did is something that virtually, in fact, I don't know of any other president who's ever done it, is after the Cuban Missile Crisis, he went on the air and talked to the American people and said, look, I'm the president of the United States. I made this mistake. I take full responsibility for it. Now, that is something that a president should do these days if they make mistakes, because look what happened. About two weeks later, it came out a poll that showed he had support of 82% of the American people. And what was amazing about that is he called me into his office the next morning. He said, Pierre, did you see that poll? He said, I sure did. He said, I hope I don't have to keep doing stupid things like that to remain popular. <laughs> but uh, on the positive side, of course, and I think it's the most important thing of the Kennedy administration was the way he solved the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yes. Yeah. We were so close to nuclear war, unbelievably close to nuclear war, that if he had not solved them and we'd had that nuclear war, the world would be a different place today. No, you and I, I don't think, would even be talking or alive. That's right. Good, you know. And, uh, the way he did it was the right way. He did it by dialogue. Right. But he understood also, and this is something that people don't understand today, uh, that uh, the Soviet mentality, and now the the same thing in the Russian government is they like what they call back-channel talks. And one of the things that I think is very important for the American people to, to understand now is this. Starting in September of 1961, there were back-channel letters going on beyond the, between Kennedy and Khrushchev. The first one actually was delivered to me in New York by a man named Georgi Bolchakov, who actually was a KGB agent. Uh, although he was the editor of a cultural uh, Soviet magazine in, uh, in 
Washington, in the Eisenhower administration, they had made a deal with the Soviets that the Soviets could have a cultural magazine in the U.S. and the U.S. could have a cultural magazine in the Soviet Union. And uh, this letter, 32 pages long, was the first letter. But over the period from uh, early September 1961 till the time Kennedy was assassinated, 45 letters passed back and forth on this back channel way between Kennedy and Khrushchev, and they were incredible letters moving towards trying to stabilize the situation between the United States and the Soviet Union and the Cold War. Unfortunately, uh, only five of those letters have ever been put out by the State Department. The other 40 letters are still hidden more than 35 years later. And I think it's important for the American public for those to, and people around the world to read those letters and understand how this back-channel work was moving towards a very important, uh, different kind of relationship between uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev. Yes.